Last night I was listening to an absolutely superb discussion on one of these podcasts about DMT. And uh, the guy who was the guest was the educated one. Um, written books and um, done lots of experiments and that sort of thing. He's a doctor and a scientist. Um, I'll post the link down in the description below. But what I found really fascinating about uh, this conversation, unlike the vast majority of others, you see, if you go and you look at, you know, DMT and you've got these clickbait, um, the classic DMT picture and this and the other. And to be quite frank, I've never seen any of those things. Um, I've never seen any machine uh, uh, gnomes, um, you know, or any little gnomes or anything like that. Invariably, I mean, I've done like 200 DMT trips, people. Um, but invariably, uh, I do my trips open-eyed out in nature. That's my preference. But when I have um, done them close-eyed, then there's just a, a mass of stuff that is absolutely incomprehensible. And the vast majority of it you, you can't possibly remember because it's, it's so outlandish. There's nothing we can relate it to. And, um, but one thing uh, about, it, it's not so much that um, what you see and how outlandish it is. It's the connection to spirits uh, or a vastly higher intelligence. And that's what this chap was speaking about last night. And he was speculating that, well, these kind of three main levels of consciousness is the, uh, the everyday world that we see with our perceptions. Then there's the dream world, and then there's this phenomenal world, the DMT world. And it's, it's very different from uh, taking uh, psilocybin. Uh, in that, I tell you, it's just, it's just vastly more intense. Very short-lived, of course, only about, about five minutes, but that's more intense. And you lose uh, any notion of yourself being a human being uh, when you kind of have this breakthrough thing, which people speak about. You become dissociated from the human being. Whereas with psilocybin, uh, I've never done that. And um, so this guy, he was speculating that he thinks if there are, and doubtless they are, other intelligence forms in the cosmos, then they are most, almost certainly not, of a physical form, so-called physical form. And... Of course, as human beings, we already know that there are the astral planes, the ethereal planes, there's um, many realms that uh, we can encounter spiritual entities in, and I've encountered plenty of that phenomenological stuff myself in different states of consciousness. And then when we look at like the simulation theory, when Nick Bostrom speaks about the simulation hypothesis and saying that it's highly likely that we are in one due to the rationale when we um, look at the possibility of being in one. And so, if it's a simulation, then we could assume that it's like computer generated. 
and that uh, there's no physical reality at all, which of course is what quantum physics tells us in any case. It's what Buddha said. Oh, fucking hell, what the fuck? Try again, right here. Yeah, you know, um, I was reading one excerpt from um, Isis Unveiled this morning. This book was written in, written in 1875. And it said, uh, what the Buddha was saying, there's one thing true in this dimension. There's no truth. And, you know, we can read all this stuff and we don't have to accept it. But when you have experiences which pertain to that, tell you that, then you have to keep very open-minded about it. It's only people when they haven't been on these excursions into um, other worlds. Again, you know, uh, quantum physicists today are speaking about other worlds. And so, when we look at all this stuff, people, there's so many portals which lead us to this reality, if not being an illusion, then most certainly not the real and the end of what's going on here. Uh, I think I've got to, uh, I've got to go back on this thing. But, um, and even when we uh, read the scriptures, then of course, you know, it's all premised on the supernatural. Uh, other dimensions that we can't enter whilst we are in this physical form. So we have to resign ourselves at some stage. That this is something we need to contend with. We, we, we cannot be the rigid Dawkins of the world Whatever. And I find it unfathomable how he um, still maintains that there is no reality right up to the point of his 82nd year. Because it is the 82nd year and he was still vehemently opposed to any spirituality. And I, yeah, I find that unfathomable. But when we look at the human being, with all their variances of perception, living in different worlds. Well, Richard Dawkins obviously, evidently, lives in a very, very different world that I live in, and has had very, very different experiences than I have had, and many other people. So, this guy, from the video, um, his name is something Gilman or Gilman or something but um, he was saying that he's been studying these DMT entities and he believes that it is a separate intelligence uh, outside of um, human consciousness until we take the DMT and then the DMT entities enter into us He's saying that we don't go anywhere. It's not like we're going somewhere. No, we take uh, those chemicals which open a portal to the DMT entities. And they enter into our consciousness and they facilitate our consciousness on whatever level our consciousness can be um, utilized then it speaks to us, the empty entities speak to us and invariably they're friendly, they're jovial, they often can be mocking, uh, sometimes they can be nefarious, but um, not often. And um, so he's saying that, well, where is this DMT world? Uh, obviously it isn't in the physical. It's in the mental, it's the conscious. It's in the conscious realm, isn't it, people? 
Where is the conscious realm? Well, it's all around us. Everything is within consciousness. And because there's no physicality to consciousness, then there's no physicality to all of these entities which reside within consciousness. You know, let's just say Yahweh, Jehovah, Allah, uh, Jesus, uh, Krishna, uh, or, or, or a Mazda, or, you know, any of these um, spiritual entities, all the angels and demons and all that sort of thing. They're all within this ethereal sort of space, aren't they? And uh, so, uh, how does that intelligence work? How does that manifest? Well, nobody knows how consciousness manifests, so we've got no idea about that. But this guy was speculating that, you see, what scientists have been doing, sending out space probes uh, with information on, hoping to get intercepted by alien forms, and then they've got this SETI thing, whereby they send out uh, radio waves trying to communicate uh, with extraterrestrials. And uh, this dude's saying, well, look, um, it, it, it's ridiculous. And Terence McKenna uh, once said something about that. He said, well, you know, sending out radio waves uh, into the cosmos uh, in the hope of finding uh, uh, extraterrestrial life. It's a bit like travelling through the cosmos in a spaceship looking for an Italian restaurant. It's, it's quite absurd. It's absurd. So what other avenue should we start to look at? Well, because nobody wants to look at consciousness, because they haven't got a clue how to look at consciousness, well, they don't know what to do, but quantum physicists are getting a little bit closer by looking smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, and within that realm, there's any number of phenomena which is exceedingly difficult uh, to get our heads around. And uh, it's like um, the Copenhagen um, experiment, uh, double slit experiment. Then it's like entanglement and, um, you know, the whole Schrodinger's cat thing. There's, there's a whole bunch of stuff which goes on in the quantum realm, which is absurd according to this physical realm. But down there, obviously, it's the root of all intelligence. And down in the quantum realm is the essence of what brings out the macro world. So you've got the micro um, in the uh, quantum, and then you've got the, the macro in the so-called physical. And the physical macro has to come out of the micro in some shape or form. And so I started to look at analogies and thinking, well, what sort of analogy could we use then as to how this happens? And um, it's kind of like, well, if we look at, um, say, like, uh, information. Yeah, I mean, what is information other than zeros and ones, um, you know, invariably in a computer? And what comes out of the zeros and ones? Well, the zeros and ones are the building blocks for all uh, intellectualizing that the human being does. You know, it creates uh, everything from the zeros and ones. Um, and uh, it is said that the cosmos is written in binary, which is zeros and ones. So everything comes out of binary. So the cosmos could be a simulation. Um, but, you know, it may not be, it may just be consciousness. It doesn't have to be simulated by anything per se. It could have just created itself. Who knows what level of creation uh, something of so, such magnitude could be. But then when we look into many worlds, like Cosmos, and where you know, very clever scientists uh, hypothesize that, well, the chances are that there are uh, infinite amounts of uh, parallel dimensions where everything conceivable goes on within. And so if we take a little bit of a stroll down that avenue, then obviously we don't need too much of a stretch of imagination to 
to start considering that there's many of these uh, other worlds which are not so called physical. And you know, when we dream, we're not in a physical world. Our avatars are not in a physical world. When we have out of body experiences, whether we go into the astral or whether we, you know, we have near death or wherever the soul or spirit or consciousness is at that time, whatever perspective it's looking from, it isn't physical. So, you know, being a human being, we don't go with our consciousness into other physical realms, do we? We never ever do that. We never end up in another physical realm whereby we're like, oh wow, this is a different world, but it's physical also. No, we end up in non-physical realms. They're all realms of the mind. And when we take uh, entheogens like um, acid, DMT, psilocybin, and we look at the world, well, the world's different. Um, sometimes very different, but not impossibly different. If I was to take uh, like 80 milligrams of um, DMT now, then all what is here would still be here only it would be offering a different uh, representation of what it is. Uh, the trees would be trees, but they'd be, they'd be trees from the Avatar movie, that sort of thing. And the grass down below would all be uh, living entities. Every single blade of it would be a living entity. And they'd all be in pattern form and symmetry and geometry and all that sort of stuff and uh, everything would be conscious and have varying creatures, nondescript creatures uh, among it, living within it. So whenever we create, um, you know, sort of uh, hypothetical scenarios and, uh, you know, cartoons of kids and we've got all these creatures and everything like that, well, these people, it seems to me like lots of them have been on DMT. Um, because uh, that's the world that you get presented with. And, um, you know, when we look at um, books uh, like Alice uh, in Wonderland, Alice Through the Looking Glass, well, of course, the, the, the writer who was uh, taking images. So, if we start to get our heads around looking smaller for other dimensions, well, you know, when, when scientists say that, oh, we think there's like 11 dimensions now, and there's probably infinite dimensions, and all that sort of stuff, it gets super, super, super wacky, as far as our individuality or collective consciousness is concerned. But, instead of thinking that, oh, aliens are coming to see us, and, um, you know, they are physical beings from another physical dimension, well... All we've got to do is look inside consciousness and see that aliens are already here, people. Aliens have been here ever since consciousness has been with man. They've been talking about aliens uh, here. Uh, sometimes they'll manifest briefly in this dimension as ethereal, like hologram type creatures. Um, but mostly they'll communicate with us and we can see them within our mind's eye, and we can interact with them within our mind's eye. And uh, sometimes we can uh, seem to appeal to them, some of them, uh, and they will maybe answer us. There's, there's lots of people that believe that. And I've had very phenomenological, uh, inexplicable experiences myself in that realm. And uh, so I don't discount that there is something called God, gods, uh, and Jesus and uh, um, Krishna and, and uh, avatars. Yeah, I, I don't discount them because I've experienced them. But um, as to what is written about them in the books that we are blessed with, I have very little allegiance with that because man has had his wicked um, uh, hand uh, in the creation of those and the majority of it is um, uh, premised in control and uh, fiction. But um, I've had experiences of Jehovah and Jesus and the devil and angels myself and long-term viewers, you'll know this. 
and I've spoken about it um, thousands of times. But of course, you know, with new viewers coming on every day, um, then they'll look at, you know, one of my videos and they'll start to make, you know, vast assumptions uh, about what I think I know and, you know, all the rest of it. And th th isn't that the, the height of stupidity and ignorance? It really is. If you come onto someone's channel and they are speaking, uh, often, you know, uh, quite assuredly about the experience that um, they've had and then people oh I don't believe this oh this guy this and this guy that well it's just the height of ignorance and stupidity and so this is why I'm pretty vociferous in lots of my videos I, I want to turn them away at any given opportunity you see when we look at what the Gnostics uh, have done they've always hidden their information because the vast majority of people simply are not worthy of it uh, you, you have to earn the privilege to be incorporated into uh, these realms. But you see, with YouTube, you've got people like me speaking about, you know, the depths of Gnosticism in many facets, and it's open to everybody. And so it's just a constant reiteration of why, you know, we shouldn't really do that. But, um, you know, how else are you going to reach people? Um, you know, even Jesus, um, you know, didn't want to cast pearls to swine and said, let the dead bury the dead, let the spiritual dead, you know, cater for, you know, their so-called physical dead because they've got no idea what we're speaking about here, so let them along their way. And Jesus had um, two methods of delivering his message. One was to the idiot and the other one was to his fraternity of Gnostics. And so, um, you know, I uh, use tactics uh, to deter the weak and the bigoted and the biased because I can affect their ego within a few seconds uh, of um, them watching any of my videos. And if they then are turned away, then that saves me a lot of bullshit in the comments. Uh, but if people uh, are attracted to something and they've got an open mind and they're, they're more intelligent and wise then they'll just watch for a long long time and they'll just listen and then slowly they'll start to piece the things together and uh, then they can form uh, valid opinions on what I'm saying through uh, the longevity of them learning about my conveyance of my experience and um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, I can um, see uh, people that uh, come and go. And, um, you know, it's kind of like a constant flux. Um, if I want to shed people from this channel, then I can just do that in an instant and all I've got to do is start decrying Jesus or start being crass or crude about something uh, which is supposed to be profane um, uh, or uh, above profanity, you know? Um, and that way, that, that's too much for them. They, their egos can't stand that. It's not their spirit. Their egos can't do it. Because if anyone's spirited, then their spirit is open. It's unaffected by what people say. Uh, and if uh, their spirit has come here to learn, then they will absorb everything uh, without being affected. Uh, and those are the people that, um, you know, I'm endeavouring to attract. And... Um, you know, be a part of um, my journey uh, because all the rest of them with their bigoted ideas and their indoctrination and hypnosis and all the rest of it well, there's, there's no future them being on this channel they're just not broad enough or conscious enough open-minded enough, intelligent enough sp spiritually endowed enough but they're just not so very often I will make one of those videos which filters I'll get rid of them all. And so, um, you know, uh, on my channel now, currently, there is less than 10% female viewers. Uh, because uh, the female viewer doesn't have the stomach for what I have to say. 
And because I'm premised in logic and rationale and philosophy and psychology, well, invariably, they just want a bit of love and light and they want to be told, um, you know, nice things, basically. And that's all women predominantly are looking for. Um, looking for nice things. Well, don't get me wrong, lots of men are looking for that also, but um, women being steeped in their emotions instead of their rational thinking ability, um, well, they have a high propensity to shy away from the things I'm going to say. They're not going to find anything here. There's no crystals and candles here, is there? And so, uh, in the old days, they used to have a lot more women viewers. Um, you know, doubtless because of the way I looked, uh, I was always out, um, often with my shirt up on the beach and, uh, you know, in great shape with a tan and I never had this beard and the fucking long hair and, you know, I was younger and so, um, uh, yeah, lots of women, you know, were stimulated by that. And, you know, I used to get many, many offers from women all over the world, inviting me here, there and everywhere. And, uh, you know, also gay blokes. And I, I used to have to say many times, I, I like, this isn't a dating channel, you know. Guys, guys, you know, this isn't a dating channel. It's a fucking psychological, philosophical, spiritual uh, channel. For fuck's sake, um, you know, try to get outside of your libido. Anyway, um, there's more to be said about this uh, DMT stuff. It's absolutely incredible and it's really great now that, um, you know, intelligent people, scientists, you know, thinkers are, are really starting to study it and post questions and, and see where they can actually go and take things seriously. Like, look, it's not just... You know, because the old scientific thing, oh, it's hallucinations, oh, it's things in your head. Because this guy says, look, everything's in your head. You can say, you know, if you saw all different sorts of entities on a DMT experience, oh, it's just in your head. Well, uh, these leaves are in my head. Uh, the trees in my head. The sky's in my head. Every single thing that I perceive is all going on in here. There is nothing per se going on out there, people. There's nothing out there save what we project onto it. So when people get their heads around that, then they might start to uh, understand the DMT experience a little bit more and the spiritual dimensions that are here and consciousness um, on mass and all different sorts of things. We have to go very, very deep, people. How many of you want to go that deep? How many of you have got the time, the inclination? How many of you are brave enough to, to, to go beyond, to, to boldly go where no men have gone before? How many of you are prepared to do that? Very few, because it's too terrifying. It's too terrifying. And you see, what this guy said about DMT is, listen, um, religious people, uh, they shouldn't be taking this, this stuff. Uh, because they are so deeply seated in their um, uh, human fiction that uh, if they experience uh, DMT it would shock them to their core beyond measure and probably there's a high possibility that they would never recover mentally from that experience because what it would do and what DMT does it completely wipes your slate clean of anything that you ever believed in or thought was a reality because it shows you that we don't know anything and there are facets to our consciousness um, pertaining to the cosmos which are so wild that y you you feel even less significant than a grain of sand on a th thousand mile beach you 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 know that just forget trying to work things out just forget it um, and uh, that's far too much for Christians because my Jesus in the sky, my God in the sky, and you know, the, these sort of things. You know, if they want to know what the root of those avatars and those concepts of gods and you know, Jesus and all that sort of thing, then they have to get very, very deep into the spiritual phenomenological realm. And to get really, really deep, then you have to enter into the entheogenic world. You have to enter into uh, very, very, very different paradigms of consciousness, people. Um, and when you do that, well, you're gonna be looking at Jesus and God very, very differently from that point forward. 
people don't want to do that. You're going to be looking at your silly jobs very, very differently. You're going to be looking at your silly mortgage and all the rest of it very, very differently. And you're going to have a whole different perspective on life and your trajectory in life will change. People aren't ready for that. They, they wouldn't know what to do if that happened to them. <laughs>